met her earlier this year at Bhutan. I thought it might be more suited to bring her to Calcutta, and it worked out well. So thanks to our partners in this author of the afternoon, Prabhakaratan Foundation, D2, Sri Simans, and Siyahi. Welcome, Sudha. And speaking to her is someone you might recognize as the Kyo Karpin girl, Deva Priya Roy, who's also an author. She's published two books, The Wake Women's Handbook and The Wake Lost Club. And amongst other things, she tells me she's working hard to complete a languishing PhD. So with that, over to you, and may I request you to begin the conversation. Welcome to Calcutta. But I believe your research for this book must have brought you to the city several times. Yes, it did. And in fact, I'm very pleased to have uh, Gulabi Didi with us today. Uh, she lived with one of King Kibo's daughters for many years. And her brother, Mong Luji, was adopted uh, by the second princess, who had no um, children of her own. So, so I thank you for being honor. here. <laughs> that, and it's not often that there is a real person in a book. book. And right. she comes. Yes. When, I, when I started reading the book, I, I could see it all happening. And it's such a gripping story, so graciously rendered. That's what I thought. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all the things. Of course, um, you know, Mohan already said how you were inspired by Amitav Ghosh's The Glass Palace, which is in itself a fine novel. But, but tell me something, Sudha, as a writer, inspiration is sort of everywhere. You know, there are several stories that catch your eye and you, you want to probe more. But what was it that you know, made you know that, no, this is the one? Because this is certainly you know, it's, it's a big project. It's a big, big project. Uh, you know, I never, I, honestly, I didn't start out with the objective of writing a book. Uh, right. uh, my objective was to find out more about um, the King Thibault, his mm -hmm. wife, and the four princesses. Mm -hmm. Honestly, more about the four princesses mm -hmm. because they intrigued me. Mm -hmm. I was curious about these girls who had grown up in exile, in isolation, without any kind of formal education. education. And then suddenly when the exile ends, they're released into the real world. How did they cope? What happened to them? And um, my objective really was to find out more about, about them. them. And I started researching. I started mm -hmm. sort of sending for books, because by then it was easy to yes, order books. Yes, just order online. Yeah, and, and, have and for, I ordered right. books from Thailand, from Burma, from America. And a lot had been written about the family mm -hmm. while they were um, uh, ruling in Mandalay. This, this book has several very moving books. And I think one of the most moving chapters is mm -hmm. about the first princess, because she came back. Um, after, after the exile mm -hmm. ended and the family went back to, to Burma, she'd had an affair with a, a, a palace palace. servant and had a child uh, with, him. with him. And this was in two, um, 1906. And um, in those days, um, a child out of uh, wedlock was uh, very frowned upon by a very Victorian uh, society conservative society. Ratnagiri was a very conservative place to live in. And although in the Burmese um, sense, um, a man and a woman in those days were considered man and wife if they had lived Eight together. From one plate yes, also. if they lived together. So that was not what her family disapproved of. But, um, but the, the family was sort of obsessed with that they were royal, blood, yes. so blue-blooded, yes, nine they, it, In fact, married. to the extent that in this dynasty, half-brothers and sisters married each other to preserve the purity of the dynasty. In fact, King Kibo and Queen Sophialas had the same, same father, father, King Mindan. So uh, for, for them, the fact that she had um, married had a, 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 staff, servant. a servant. And another was. very strong element was the fact that he was non-Buddhist. He was non-Buddhist. Because right. that mattered yeah. a lot. Um, also. Yeah. So you wrote a book because you couldn't find a book like this to read. Exactly. Exactly. I've, I've Which, always enjoyed reading. <laughs> so I, and I wrote it as a human interest story. I wrote it um, <clears throat> with the details that I wanted to know more about. And I soon realized that um, in order to make it a meaningful book, mm -hmm. one couldn't just write about the lives of the king and the queen mm -hmm. and four and princesses. And sort of it there. Yes. It had to be in the context of the history, of the culture, of the social 
um, uh, norms of the period, um, of the politics of the period. Mm. So that was all worked in, but they were a subsidiary uh, point mm. of the story. The story really, um, as I wrote it, is the biography mm. of the family. Mm. It's the story of the family. Um, I was swimming in, um, I think, an ocean of raw right. research. Right. So for right. me, also, it was crafting it into as strong a storyline right. as I so possibly we'll, we'll, could. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well, because the structuring is excellent. Um, what I think is really important is that even, even in, especially I would say, in historical writing, um, there are different perspectives that the author brings in. And I think that perhaps because this is, as an Indian, you wrote this book, you waded through this material. I think it's an alternative way also of looking, because we have also dealt with British imperialism and the, the colonial narrative in, for a long time now. Right. So I think that that is a breakthrough uh, moment also in, in studying um, the family of the king. I, you know, it was interesting. Um, it was, yes, I did look at it from an Indian point of view because I am, um, uh, you know, have an Indian perspective. But for me, it was also... Or, uh, or let's say a non-Eurocentric uh, view, yes, you know. Yes, oh. but also I did a lot of um, personal interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, not with just family mm. members or those mm. connected with the mm. family, but also with Burmese historians. Right. Uh, because I wanted, I was very clear that I wanted the Burmese perspective. Yes. Uh, I yes. also got a lot of material translated. But can you help me find Mongluji? Right. So uh, they went to this majestic hotel. The majestic hotel people said, we have no idea where he is. Now, but because he is, had retired he already. He had retired mm -hmm. many years before. But they said there's a Burmese, uh, a, Buddhist, a Burmese Buddhist temple in um, Calcutta. Calcutta. So if you go to that temple, maybe they can help you locate. And they knew where Gulabi Didi was. So they, someone gave Gulabi Didi's address over there. Mm -hmm. So then my friend's parents sent um, their nephew to locate Gulabi Didi. Okay. Then when I phoned Gulabi Didi, she was not very friendly in the beginning. Because she, she didn't know who was calling. She, <laughs> she, said, she said, I'm sick of journalists asking me for information. So I said, I'm not a journalist. <laughs> I said, I just want to meet you. She said, for what? So mm. I said, I just want a little bit of information. Mm. Give me as much mm. or as little mm. as you want. And then I kept phoning her until mm. finally we got friendly over the phone. Then I said, I begged her because for me, um, feeling something is as important as reading it. So mm. I wanted, because I knew the second princess had mm. settled in Kalimpong. Mm. So it was very important for me to visit Kalimpong, but I knew I had, didn't have a hope in hell of finding all the homes that she'd lived yeah. in, unless mm. Gulabi Didi came with me, yeah. because she had lived in Kalimpong. So with, I, with her, right? She yes. Actually in so I begged her to come with me to Kalimpong. So we went on this expedition <laughs> together, <laughs> which was very exciting. And then we just yeah. kept in touch. And so, okay, so quickly tell me about the structuring of the book, because this is something which, as an author, I feel is really hard to perfect, to get right. But the shape of the book is sort of like the shape of a house. So you have to <laughs> do the structuring yeah. well. <clears throat> Actually, um, my objective, the heart of my research, and original research, which has not been written about Anywhere before, else. is the second and the third part of the book. Right. Which second part, the first part of my book, um, the second, second part is during the exile. The third part is after the exile, where the family is today. Mm. But I felt that in order for a reader to understand the context, to understand what the family had been, to understand what they lost and where they were, they needed to understand the period in Mandalay. Um, so I yeah. started off, it's very linear in that I started off in Mandalay, while just before they became king and queen, mm. Then, um, uh, uh, during it's the... fascinating, the details. Yeah. Oh, my God. You know, for me, the details um, were very important because they helped bring the protagonists alive, alive. for me. Uh, I wanted to get into their shoes. I wanted to understand them as human beings. I wanted to understand how they ticked, what, what interested them, what didn't. So it was important. Those details were very, very important. And also, it, the details helped me color the book because it nuanced the book. It gave it um, 
um, um, feeling, the characters I felt would come alive for the reader as a result. Yes. So who were your favorite characters? I have to ask you this. <laughs> the person whose story moved me the most was the first princess. Uh, I had first thought of only writing about her. Uh, hers was really, I think, a truly tragic story where she was betrayed by every single person. So do you want to read a little bit? Uh, so the, it's a bit about her, about the queen <laughs> that you... Okay. Do we have this? We have time, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, the reason I'm choosing this particular bit is because this was the turning point. You know, until then, the uh, Burmese monarchy, the king and queen, had been um, uh, sort of uh, under the illusion that the war with the British was going not in the, it was in their favor, that they weren't losing the war. But suddenly they realized at some stage that, you know, the, Briti the British had arrived at their doorstep. A quiet dread had hung palpably over the palace on the night of 27th November. This is um, 1885. And had prevented almost everyone from sleeping. Queen Supyalat was out of we bed well before dawn the next morning. In the ver very early hours, in one of the palace rooms overlooking the garden, some of her maids saw her and her mother weeping in each other's arms. The queen bathed and got ready as usual, and after a few tense hours, a messenger came to her with the report that the British had arrived at the shores of Mandalay. On hearing this, in spite of her pregnancy, the queen slowly climbed up the long, arduous spiral stairs of the tower, of, this is the watchtower, uh, to witness the spectacle for herself. The sight of thousands of British troops marching towards the palace seems to have been her moment of truth the moment that finally drove home the inevitability of what was to come and which destroyed in her any hope of a miraculous salvation. She carefully descended the stairs and then collapsed in the courtyard. An embarrassed crowd watched as she sobbed and rose up on her knees and beat her breast with her hands and cried out, It is I, I alone, I the Queen, that has brought destruction to the king, my husband, and my people. It is I, I alone. Then, quiet, qu then quickly composing herself, she disappeared into an inner room of the palace. A non-fiction story. So a lot of times, uh, probably the people that you're staying with uh, or when you're researching uh, content in the book, so sometimes they have, uh, they make it a little larger than life. So as um, a person who uh, wants it accurate, yeah, so how do you actually decipher uh, that, uh, you know, the knowledge, whether it's fact or whether it's, um, you know, fiction, and how do you actually assemble? Uh, you know? This well, is a very important question, right. actually. <laughs> well, I always try to um, verify sources in the sense that if there was a m multiple people who told me the same thing. So that was important. Like when I mentioned I met 30, 40 people in Ratnagiri other than the descendants, it was to get the mm. stories from different points of view so that one could try and get a thread of the honest story. Um, uh, also, I did use a lot of archival material, which you know were facts as reported and written at that time. Um, however, it wasn't always possible to verify every bit of information. Uh, in cases where um, I wasn't very sure, I tried to qualify that in my book, that according to so-and-so, so -and -so. Okay. or um, this version may not be accurate, or that there were multiple versions of, because very often you had multiple versions of the same story. Um, also, um, you know, when you have become so immersed in a story, certain things ring true and certain things just don't. Now, that also is judgment, which I feel as an author one can't totally rely on because you are sometimes a little more biased towards one protagonist or the other. Let's say ambivalent generosity to the British for the pension, etc. One could also argue that there's a sense of generosity in the British overall, in the sense that they built him a palace in Ratnagiri. They did not have done that, they could have just thrown him out. And when I contrast that, there is a, in a sense, a singularity of purpose. What I mean by that, over the years, you take the anglo mysore wars, it stretches over 50 years, the three of them, the Anglo-Sikh wars, the three of them stretching 40 years. 
the Anglo Dan Wars, the Anglo Burmese Wars. They're all over a period of time, right. particularly 60 years, three and four wars in some cases. There's a remarkable singularity of purpose that the East India Company and then the British themselves drive towards to achieve something. Right. But I also find that in many cases balanced by this sense of, let's say, generosity for lack of a better word. They did provide in some sense for the children, the descendants, this. There was fun. Financial uh, generosity, yes. Sure. Which but is not true for a lot of other conquerors. No, very true. They were financially uh, generous. They did try to be fair. But certainly uh, the considerations of the empire and economic considerations always overrode humanitarian ones. Because if you see in the case of the princesses, they did not want them to get married because they did not want an heir. So it was, you know, the, the, the lives of the princesses or the future of the princesses was not a consideration. Exiling, yes, because the, 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 the overriding, the overarching uh, uh, objective was to secure the empire. Exiling King Thibaut to uh, Ratnagiri was again not a humanitarian move. Can I just join in? This is a piece of information. Two things I want to ask. When you were doing this research and maybe a lot of stories you have come across and few of the stories you are incorporating in your book, any of the stories you find with the, any similarity with the history of the Indian royal families? And the second thing is, the Indian royal families have a lot of connection with Thailand, Nepal, even Turkey and also. Which royal family has the strongest connection in terms of marriage or something with the yeah. royal family in history? Um, in, in, Indian royal family? Yes. Actually, uh, the, the, um, uh, not King Thibaut's direct line, but um, uh, the prince of Sikkim was supposed to marry the Limbin princess's, uh, prince's uh, daughter. Uh, but then he died of uh, poisoning. Yes. But yes. Uh, was the kingdom of Thailand? Um, uh, it was Siam in those Siam, days. Yes. And um, the kingdom of the fourth princess, in fact, uh, did. Um, there was an interest from a Siamese prince, prince. for marriage with her. Oh. Uh, but by then she was always involved, already involved with the man who was going to be her husband, Coco Nai. Well, yes, I did have the luxury. <laughs> Seven years. Yeah, I must. Uh, you know, it was. I think the next book would be a little quicker because for me it was also learning the craft. I have no. I didn't even know how to footnote properly. I'd forgotten from my college days. I remember asking mm. Professor Chani. I went in. Mm. So did you get one of those little uh, MLA booklets? Too? No, not MLA, that, that Chicago, Chicago uh, style manual, manual yeah. and all that. I, so there was a lot of learning in between of writing too. I loved it though, I just loved the whole thing. Oh, I've never, I've never, what is this? But is it a, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Whatever I've never done you. that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I, I've never had that done. Yeah. <laughs>